Hello, my name is Rick Pearson. Welcome to Prophecy USA, a program specifically designed to unveil the hidden mystery of America's role in Bible prophecy. You know, we've learned in past lessons that America's culture was founded upon the Bible's moral protocol. But unfortunately, for a large group of believers today, the immoral activity of modern culture has seduced them to walk away from that protocol. So stay tuned for a checkup from the neck up to see if you're part of that falling away. Welcome back, folks. In our previous lessons, we've unveiled multiple descriptions of Babylon the Great. We've attempted to stay riveted to God's Word for each and every description as we look into America's changing culture. A nation's culture is a reflection of the spirits that are in that culture. As Babylon falls into spiritual darkness, the culture manifests the character traits of every spirit invading it. Spirits express themselves through people. Of course, those who walk under the spiritual obedience of God's Word are guaranteed that His Holy Spirit will lead, guide, and direct them. If a person's Bible is falling apart, it's very probable that their life is not. But those who refuse to walk under its directives are guaranteed to be swept into the darkness. Walking with God in Babylon, as taught last week, is like a fish swimming upstream. There will be resistance, there will be opposition, but we are guaranteed great victory for those who overcome. So at this point, it's very important to stress that God's national covenant blessings of provision, guidance, and protection begin to wane within Babylon's structure. The spiritual forces that have entered her culture, her government, and even her legislative assemblies become quite evident. The problem with America is that not everyone loves its covenant with God. And the falling away affects many believers who have put their trust in everything else but the word they are supposed to be following. Now, the enemies of America and the co of America's covenant are not coming. They're already here. These folks don't want God. They don't want prayer. They don't want the Ten Commandments. And they do not want the mandated moral lifestyle that keeps that covenant intact. However, prophecy tells us that God will empower believers to raise up a shout in Babylon the Great. This shout, very similar to Lot's warnings in Sodom, will warn everyone to come out of her, my people, partake not in her sins nor in her plagues. Those sins are instigated by ancient Babylonian spirits that have invaded the culture. And unless individuals adhere to the warnings to come back to God, those spirits will drive them into abominable acts. Listen as our narrator explains how spirits from ancient Babylon have invaded our culture and are seducing believers today. Listen to this. In his admonition to the seven churches, Jesus says, I know your works. He is speaking to practicing Christians who are living during the last days, and he warns us today just as he warned them 2,000 years ago to let him who has ears hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. In essence, he is talking directly to modern day believers. In researching the falling away or apostasia of the churches the angel of Revelation addressed, Ephesus, Sardis, and Smyrna, the next group of believers we will look at lived in Pergamos and Thyatira. In Revelation chapter 2 we read, These things I say unto Pergamos, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast them that hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to practice sexual immorality. So also some of you hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, 
If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. But to the one who overcometh, I will give a new name. The fifth church who has a very similar problem with sexual immorality as Pergamos is the modern day church of Thyatira. After affirming the righteous believers in Revelation 2, he continues to warn the rest of the church of Thyatira, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. The present day churches of Pergamos and Thyatira have a problem with sexual immorality. But who exactly is Balaam, the Nicolaitans, and Jezebel? Welcome back, folks. You know, our narrator just described two out of seven churches that will appear in the very last days. Pergamos and Thyatira will definitely appear within Babylon the Great. Now, by now, we already know that the word Babel means confusion, and Babylon the Great is filled with great confusion when it comes to gender identity and sexual immorality. And as vividly warned in Scripture, the spiritual confusion that invades Babylon's culture also invades believers who have no foundation in God's Word. Jesus warned that these assemblies would be seduced by doctrines of devils taught by unanointed leaders whose only goal is to climb the corporate ladder of the religious social clubs. But there is nothing new under the sun. Jesus warns believers in the last days by referring to the moral issues Pergamos and Thyatira battled 2,000 years ago. But Jesus goes even further back into history, showcasing people in the Old Testament who literally destroyed themselves by participating in sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 10 says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand, and were destroyed of serpents. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. To the church of Pergamos, Jesus mentions Balaam and the Nicolaitans. Who is Balaam? And what exactly is a Nicolaitan? Now, Balaam was a false prophet at the time of Israel's entrance into the Promised Land around 1450 B.C. Forty years after Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, Joshua brought them into the Promised Land and was immediately opposed by the Moabites who were living in that land. Now, in Numbers 22, King Balak of Moab offered to pay Balaam money to curse the invading Israelite army. However, God intervened by literally speaking to Balaam through the voice of a donkey, warning him not to curse the children of Israel. Balaam obeyed the Lord, much to King Balak's dislike. Israel eventually defeated the Moabites, but Balaam convinced the Israelites not to kill the Moabite women, but instead take them as wives. And those wives eventually led Israel's men into embracing their pagan gods. Those worship ceremonies involve sexual activity with multiple partners as they worship the ancient Babylonian god known as Baal. Now in Numbers 25, the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they, the daughters of Moab, called the men of Israel unto the sacrifices of their gods and the men of Israel did eat and bowed down to those gods, and Israel joined himself unto Baal. Now, believers today who practice Balaam's tactics are motivated by a total lack of understanding. Sexual involvement with anyone outside the bond of holy matrimony is a form of defiance against God's laws. It's putting your sensual appetite ahead of God's moral code of ethics. The doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of defiance. Revelation 2 explains that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans work hand in hand with practices of Balaam. Some of you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine works from the top down within church structure by leadership actually teaching heresies to those who will follow them. The initiator of this problem began with a man called Nicholas. Nicholas of Antioch was a leader within the church of Antioch. He converted from paganism to Judaism 
and eventually to Christianity. However, Nicholas taught a doctrine of compromise, implying that total separation between Christianity and the practice of pagan rituals was not necessary. He taught a, perver a perverted form of grace. It was a doctrine like unto you can say what you want, you can do what you want with anyone you want, and God's grace will suffice, everyone's going to heaven. Nicholas of Antioch was immersed in pagan occultism, and he had no problem seducing and teaching Christian believers to participate with him in those immoral practices. The fact is, Nicholas was a groomer. His ultimate goal was control. Now, the name Nicolaitan is deri derived from two Greek words, nikos, meaning to conquer or subdue, and laos, meaning laity. Nicolaitan is a dual meaning adjective describing religious leadership who conquer and subdue believers of Christ by enticing them to leave sound doctrine and by appealing to their fleshly desires. Jesus despised the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He knows that following their teachings will lead a person to utter destruction. Hebrews says, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Now the Greek word beset here Litter means controls or obstructs us from entering into God's blessings. So what are some of the present day Nicolaitan doctrines that would obstruct us from following God's word? Today we have liberal progressive church leaders who defy and deny basic Christian doctrines concerning uh, denials of the word of God, denying the virgin birth, the death and resurrection of Jesus, and the necessity of repentance from sin or the existence of an eternal hell for not repenting of that sin. Timothy said that the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but with itching ears will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn many away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. John warned us, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Did you know that God actually encourages us to test and discern what people are teaching you? And the litmus test, of course, is always the Word of God. So how do we test these spirits with the Word of God? Stay tuned, we'll be right back with the answer to that question. Theological seminaries have inundated churches preaching that America is not in the Bible. Prophecy teachers have regurgitated for years that America is not in the Bible. But what does the Bible say? Prophecy USA is proud to present a 30-page brochure filled with scripture debunking the biggest lie keeping the body of Christ in darkness today. America is fully detailed in scripture over 53 times. And now we want to put God's word directly into your hands. America's role in Bible prophecy is rapidly being fulfilled and her judgment is coming. For a gift of $15 plus shipping and handling, we will send you this amazing brochure. For a gift of $50, we will send you five brochures. For $100 or more, we will rush to you 10 brochures. And for a ministry gift of $500, we will send you both our books, The Hour That Changes Everything, and The Coming Exodus, plus 20 brochures for your friends, family, and relatives. Call today. Welcome back, folks. You know, we've just studied about the false prophet Balaam and how he was used in the Old Testament to deceive Jewish believers into following after sexual immorality in the form of Baal worship. However, Jesus warns us that the same deception Balaam achieved would be utilized in the last days by false teachers called Nicolaitans. Their teachings would seduce Christians away from the word of God. John reminds us to test the spirits whether they be from God. But how do we test the spirits 
And what are some of the modern day myths that the Nicolaitan teachers are teaching today? What are they saying about Jesus and the Judeo-Christian values that our society was built upon? Today we have liberal progressive church leaders who deny the virgin birth, the death and resurrection of Jesus. They denounce the necessity of repentance from any form of sexual activity outside of marriage. A massive change within our North American culture has taken place with regard to traditional marriage between a man and a woman. Progressive church leaders even deny the existence of hell. Some have stated that the Bible is no longer relevant for our modern day culture. However, according to scripture, those opinions are no longer relevant for heaven. Prophecy warns us that those who have fallen away are fulfilling the very prophecies that they themselves defy. So let's test some of these doctrines with God's word. And here are some of the modern day teachings. Some Nicolaitan doctrines claim that Jesus was a prophet, but not the son of God. Jesus himself claimed to be the son of God. And according to scripture, salvation can only be achieved by confessing that truth. Now, Paul states that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. John said when the Holy Spirit has come, he will draw all men unto Jesus. Jesus said, how can ye be, being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Now, if a spiritual leader does not preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are teaching you a Nicolaitan doctrine. This is not the spirit of Christ coming out of that vessel. It's another spirit. John said, every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Remember, Jesus said, if we confess him as Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. But saved from what? Paul admonishes us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, why would the man who wrote two thirds of the New Testament tell us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Maybe because it says that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And also the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Did you know that according to Isaiah 11, fear is one of the seven spirits or characteristics of God's presence. It means to have a holy reverence and that the Messiah would supernaturally manifest those characteristics. The spirit of the Lord would rest upon him the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. In Luke, Jesus referred to Isaiah 11 when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. However, according to Isaiah 11:3, Jesus would delight himself in the fear of the Lord. Now you might be thinking, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But there are two types of fear in the Bible. There's a worldly fear and there's a godly fear. Perfect love casts out worldly fear because fear has torment. But Jesus distinguished the two fears by saying, don't fear man, which can kill the body, but rather fear God, who can destroy both your body and your soul in hell. Now, Jesus mentions hell four specific times in the book of Revelation. The cowardly, the abominable, murderers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, will have their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, since Jesus himself warned us of hell, how can modern day teachers deny that hell exists? Obviously, this is another spirit at work 
and I'm going to give you a hint. It's not the Holy Spirit. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus tells us that we can have victory over worldly fear by walking first in godly love, and when we walk in perfect love, we overcome the fear of man. For greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So if you want to become an overcomer, you must be able to cast down the doctrines of the Nicolaitan spirit. You have to decide to either fear God and follow the word or fear man and follow the herd. The Nicolaitan spirit, however, operates within Babylon the Great in order to push believers toward their secular humanist groupthink ideology. The word phobia is defined as an excessive fear of something, and it's irrational. There's an undeniable fear of man today within North American culture. If you do not follow the herd of modern day woke agenda, you will be falsely accused of a multitude of phobias if you don't agree and comply to the liberal agenda. Specific terminology and name calling is used and it's all based on the fear of man. And we've already discussed some of those terms used in biblical protocol. Homophobic means you disagree with the current LGBT ideology. A xenophobic means that you have a fear of illegal immigrants. But this just, just is the tip of the iceberg for how our modern day Babylonian society and the Nicolaitan spirit is trying to bully believers away from following God's word. Jesus mentioned some new names with regard to the church of Thyatira. He said, notwithstanding Thyatira, I have a few things against thee. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So who exactly is Jezebel and why is she called a prophetess? In 850 BC, Jezebel was queen of Israel with King Ahab during the time of Elijah's ministry. Jezebel was originally from Phoenicia and promoted Baal worship throughout Israel, which Jesus referred to as the deep things of Satan. Jezebel's death was prophesied by Elijah when she literally was thrown out of a window, plunging to her death, and the dogs came and licked her blood in the streets of Jerusalem. But exactly what is Baal worship? In 3000 BC, King Nimrod and Queen Semiramis reigned in ancient Babylon along the Euphrates River, where current day Iraq exists today. This, of course, was where the Tower of Babel was built. And according to the Bible Knowledge Commentary, Queen Samaranus, Samarimus claimed to become pregnant with a son while she was still a virgin. From the deifying of this son came the fertility god known as Baal. Baal's counterpart was the female goddess Asherah. The worship of the fertility goddess Asherah was carried on throughout the centuries by a multitude of nations. Asherah was worshipped by driving a pole into the ground, which historians believe was carved into the image of a woman. Both female and male sodomite prostitutes were involved in the worship ceremonies. These rituals around the poles involved multiple forms of sensual activity, stimulating worship worshipers to either watch or even participate in the various, various sexual acts with the prostitutes or with each other. Now, every generation of Judeo-Christian believers has had to overcome this spirit. In 1600 BC, Joshua battled Baal worshipers when the children of Israel entered into the Promised Land. In 1150 BC, God instructed Gideon to tear down the altar of Baal and literally cut down the Asherah poles in his fight with the pagan Midianites. 300 years later, in 850 BC, at Mount Carmel, Elijah called down fire from heaven and single-handedly killed 450 prophets of Baal. Asherah 
became Ishtar, both in Egypt and historical Babylon. The Greeks in 500 BC called her Aphroditus. The Romans called her Venus. And during the same time period, she was worshipped in Ephesus, being called Diana. In 670 BC, King Josiah received 40 years of blessing upon the land of Israel because he thoroughly purged Israel from the sin of Baal worship. Now, Baal and Ashtoreth are still worshipped this very day, and the deep things of Satan, which Jesus called them, are slickly marketed throughout the multimedia world of the adult entertainment industry. The spirits of ancient Babylon have merely reinvented themselves within our society. And remember, there's nothing new under the sun. And until today, I'm sure that most of us thought pole dancing was a North American invention. Did you know that the word Baal in Hebrew literally means master? Millions of men are addicted to slaves to this master, watching daily at their altars of Baal within their own households, viewing over 246 million pages of pornography provided freely through the internet. Now, within this $13 billion global pornographic industry, Hollywood is the number one producer, completing one pornographic movie every 37 minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our Lady of Kingdoms truly has become the Lady of Pernia, just as prophecy said she would. Believers in the church of Thyatira were deceived by sexual immorality then and there, just as the general populace are deceived here and now by the same Babylonian spirit of Baal worship. But the warning Jesus gives us in Revelation is this. Those who commit adultery with her, with Jezebel, I will throw into great tribulation, except they repent. And this brings us to the next three countdowns of Babylon's description. She has believers of Pergamos and Nicolaitan teachers of Baal. She has the believers of Thyatira manipulated under the spirit of Jezebel. And Babylon has over 3,500 Asherah poles located in every state of the Union, firmly establishing temples of Baal worship throughout the nation. Our team at Prophecy USA are mandated to raise up a shout concerning the secret things that God's word declares is coming to America. But what God has in store for those who follow him and those who follow Baal will simply take your breath away. So don't miss next week's program. This is Prophecy USA. My name's Rick Pearson, and I'm reminding you, Jesus is alive, and he's coming back much sooner than many people realize. See you next week on Prophecy USA. Shalom.